Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Leanne George, coordinator of the SPEC survey program at the Association of Research Libraries, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for the third in a series of SPEC survey webcasts today. Today we're here from the authors of the survey on rapid fabrication maker spaker services. Uh, the results of this survey have been published in SPEC Kit 348. Uh, before our presenter begins, uh, I have just a few announcements. Everyone but the presenters has been muted to cut down on background noise, so if you are part of a group today, feel free to speak among yourselves. But we do want you to join the conversation by typing questions in the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen. I'll read the questions aloud before the presenters answer them. The webcast is being recorded, and we will send registrants the slides and a link to the recording um, in the next week or so. Now, let me introduce our presenters today. Dr. Micah Altman is Director of Research and Head Scientist in the Program on Information Science for the MIT Libraries. Matt Bernhardt is a web developer at the libraries. Lisa R. Horwitz is the Assessment and Linguistics Librarian at MIT Libraries. And Randy Shapiro is a Senior Administrative Assistant supporting Chris Berg, the Director of the Libraries, and the work of the Program on Information Science. Wen Liu, who is a research intern in the Program on Information Science, uh, isn't able to join us today. So use the hashtag ARLSpecKit348 to continue the conversation with them on Twitter. And now let me turn the presentation over to Micah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the talk today will go over a number of key concepts in makerspaces and rapid fabrication. We'll talk about the strategic positioning of makerspaces for a library, and then about the survey results, which are, are focusing on, on research library adoption and, and with recommendations uh, and next steps. And there will be time after that for substantive questions, 20 minutes or so, uh, during the presentation, if you have any, any clarifying questions, please uh, use the, the chat and we'll, we'll attempt to clarify any confusions. Um, there's a bunch of boilerplate, um, the most important of which is simply that uh, if you like any of this, uh, then it's all due to all of my uh, collaborators and supporters and uh, to Leanne's editing. And if you don't like something in the presentation, then uh, I messed it up. And during the, the presentation, uh, there will be a lot more uh, words on the slides than I will speak through. Uh, they're, they're for background and uh, and context, but don't worry, um, we'll hit all the key concepts. So a really interesting thing about rapid fabrication and maker spaces is that they complete a life cycle loop between uh, fabrication and digitization, between producing information and producing objects. Um, on and and so they they form a part of the information life cycle. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the concepts in the fabrication part, and then a little bit about the input. And in between there, there are all of the things that uh, libraries help with in terms of managing information. On the fabrication side, fabrication in this. Uh, domain refers to the production of physical objects from digital models. Now, depending on the type of uh, machinery you use, this can happen at a range of different scales from the, the microscopic to uh, architectural materials from 
um, plastics to organic material to metals, shapes, time frame, budgets, and other considerations. We won't go into all of those things in, in detail, but you should be aware that there are three broad forms of fabrication. One form of fabrication, and this is this sort of uh, old style, uh, certainly still in use, very useful, but not where a lot of the, the new advances are coming from, are the subtractive, which means you've got a block of stuff and you remove some material from it. Uh, in the you know in, in the old days you might use a hand plane or uh, a lathe and newer uh, methods include laser cutting uh, plasma cutting CNC there's also uh, a deformative process where you build uh, a, a frame or a mold and then use um, the material to wrap around that. But where the uh, technological advances have, have been coming most thick and fast are in the additive process. Often this is called, quote, 3D printing, unquote. Technically, 3D printing is only one form of additive manufacturing. Um, generally, additive manufacturing involves plastic, but all sorts of materials can be used. And it's usually a, a layered assembly process and a hugely developing industry. Now, the other side of this coin is developing models to make into physical. And there are broadly two forms of uh, digitization here, uh, contact or non-contact. On the contact, side, a contact scanning acts like a, a 3D mouse and it requires physical contact. Um, more uh, newer techniques involve different forms of scanning um, from small scale scans like MakerBot to large scans using, using la lasers across um, entire buildings. Um, and in between the, the, the process of digitization and fabrication, there's, of course, a life cycle of management and modification of the information. Now that we have some context straight, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the strategic significance. Uh, and first, I'll start with a, a few examples. And some of these examples are actually things that uh, we learned that people at MIT were doing the last time that we, we put on a, a course on this. Uh, there are various uses in both teaching and in research, uh, and various communities are, are using this. At the, the student side, uh, examples can be as diverse as creating an attachment for a robot or other machinery, uh, doing um, advanced fashion design, using algorithms to design the next fashions, um, or using uh, models as a way of communicating, uh, of visualizing information. Uh, in the lab and industry, uh, there are a whole range of uses from medical implants to teaching aids to architecture. And then on the experimental side, there are, are many things that are on the horizon, uh, from pharmaceuticals to embedded sensors and printable electronics, which would mean that not only would you be able to print something, but you'd be able to, to create something that uh, functioned actively, possibly collected more information that you would use in creating a new object. Fabrication is not just for engineers, it can produce um, benefits that, that improve research in a whole bunch of different disciplines. And it does that in, in a number of ways. One, by enabling control over the materials for physical objects, both 
from shape to composition to behavior as we get more and more technology. Um, it lowers barriers uh, both to, to making objects, to portability, to how long it takes to set up, uh, set up a physical environment for researching, or what skills are needed. And even more exciting, it enables new forms of design, design that's, that's localized to particular constraints, uh, that reacts to an environment that is generated from a algorithm or a theoretical construct, or that involves an uh, information cycle of sampling the world, incorporating in that object, remixing, and, and iterating. Because rapid fabrication creates, uh, creates information and uses information, there are, are a number of opportunities to support uh, the information lifecycle related to, to rapid fabrication. And this includes everything from helping people manage information from interventions to helping with digitization to, to managing collections of these objects. And we found through our own uh, work in this area and through literature view that approaching this area for patrons generally requires answering a number of questions that are not specific to a particular discipline. Uh, can a physical object solve my, my problem? Where are there existing models? How can I uh, use an existing object to make a model? Or how do I modify it? It's not just the last stages of where can I find something to, to print, uh, some place to print, and how can I prepare a model to be printed? So our survey focused on library adoption, uh, the penetration of maker spaces into research libraries, and the, the pathways that research libraries were taking to um, make use of this new technology. Uh, and what we, what we found was uh, a little surprising from our, our point of view that many research libraries are very actively engaged in maker spaces. Uh, of the uh, the respondents, over 60% uh, of research libraries were engaged in either uh, providing, piloting, or actively planning a makerspace service offering, and uh, over 15% more were investigating it. Uh, so there are, there are very uh, small percentage of libraries for whom this area is not on the resource radar at all. Of those uh, engaged in providing or piloting or planning makerspace service offerings, the core services generally include reference services, addressing at least some of the questions in the, in the previous slide, training on the equipment, providing and maintaining fabrication equipment, maintaining digitization equipment, and uh, supporting some sort of repository of the information, the models that are produced from this. The core equipment and software generally focus on 3D printers, 3D scanners, and supporting design and conversion software. And there are common supporting services, training and uh, pathfinders, online bid guides. But this Although the, the core focus is on 3D printing and 3D scanning, we saw an amazing range of software and hardware technologies that libraries were, uh, were offering. Uh, this included things like hand tools, 3D pens, virtual reality goggles and visualization walls, uh, industrial sewing machines, and even, even drones. So uh, libraries are, are, are experimental in this area. We asked a number of questions to evaluate and understand the, how, how makerspaces were being implemented in, 
in libraries uh, in an attempt to understand what the, what the minimum buy-in was and what the target audience was. Very, a relatively small percentage of respondents based expected use on specific user demands. But all of them almost targeted undergraduates as expected users, most expected graduate students, and about half expected faculty to make use of these resources. Most of these services came from existing funding streams, from the general budget and using existing staff. And uh, a, a small minority, uh, less than a third, charge fees for this service, even for, for materials. Uh, and the core resources, generally the leading resources varied, but staff time was most commonly named as the, uh, the biggest resource uh, and equipment. Uh, and the median uh, service had three staff members part-time at greater than the 20 percent. There was a wide variation in the space available needed for this service. Though we did have a, a respondent uh, indicate they used 9,000 square feet for uh, a makerspace. Uh, the median was quite smaller. It's possible to deploy a makerspace service in a relatively small footprint. And to deploy it in several months, though, though some services required longer time. Overall, the library experience that was reported to us has been quite positive. 40% uh, of respondents conducted formal assessment, and that was based on usage data, user observation, satisfaction sur surveys. Uh, in Overall, they reported generally positive evaluations, and, and many made some changes to extend or improve their services. No library reported uh, reducing their services as, a, as part of this evaluation. But there was a note that there are a number of common challenges, and the, the, the big focus was on resource and maintenance. Uh, generally, people people spoke pretty highly of, of the service. Um, one of, of our respondents said, during the pilot phase, we gauged interest from anyone we could talk to. And it became clear that the applications for the technology are so broad that any department could use it. I think this, this speaks to uh, the interdisciplinary nature of this service. And there were all sorts of high-flying quotes about the, the uh, potential for this service as a catalyst, as a hub, as a next step for scholarship, etc. And those are just representative quotes. So overall, and this, this goes uh, somewhat beyond the responses, uh, but we have a number of recommendations reflecting on this. Uh, makerspaces connect with a number of library core competencies. Um, libraries have core competency in information, in interdisciplinarity, in building a form of literacy with information and being able to create physical objects with information as a new sort of literacy, and in supporting uh, research and teaching and creating spaces for research and learning. All of these um, dovetail with makerspaces. So overall, the feedback that, that we got in the survey, together with the literature review, suggests that fabrication is a, a potential fit for research library. It addresses a strategic opportunity to provide new services and to develop uh, learning and, and teaching and research spaces. It aligns with library core values and competencies and serves a potentially broad patron community. But there are a number of caveats. 
this is uh, very much a do-it-yourself culture, not an off-the-shelf solution. These systems are um, reported as high maintenance, as uh, requiring knowledge in both the specifics of the system and in, in other related competencies. And it's important not only to get the system and the service contract, but to engage in readings, in conferences, and in events. And, and really to invest more in human capital, in the people and expertise to uh, address the core information lifecycle and service question than, than in a specific set of equipment and skills around maintaining that. Uh, and it was also stressed that this is a rapidly changing environment and that one should plan for change. And we see this change at, at three levels. Short-term change be, implies that the equipment is going to require maintenance and care. Uh, and so it's not a plug-and-play environment or a set-it-and-forget-it environment. The second level of change is that these technologies are changing rapidly. So what might be a, a very good choice of, of hardware today might not be the optimal service in the next two years, three years. And in the long term, the rapid changes of technology are causing business models to evolve. For example, we would expect to see more fabrication services. Overall, the makerspace serves a lot of purposes and builds, and there's a, a lot of room for reference service, teaching, data management. So it's, it's not all about hardware, but one should expect the, the hardware needs and the role of libraries as a, as a hardware provider or gateway to change over time. Because uh, continuing education and engagement is so important, we spent some time on, um, on the resources section. Uh, there are still very few books and articles on them, and most are at the high level. But there are a number of, of resources, and particularly conferences and events, and, and active repositories where people are sharing their models. And uh, this is a, a very important part of engaging in this service. Now we have more boilerplate. You can always ask us questions afterwards. And these slides will be posted later this week. Thank you, Micah. And just to reiterate, we do want your questions, so please join the conversation by typing those questions in the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen. Uh, we have one coming in now. Um, Margaret asks, how do libraries deal with troubleshooting reference questions related to CAD software that their staff aren't familiar with? How do you create that do-it-yourself ethos? Well, I, I would invite my, my colleagues also to jump in. Um, we did not get responses specifically to that, uh, but from looking at some of the, the resources that libraries make available, there are often a number of uh, general tutorials, videos, um, mailing lists and other, other help groups associated with software and with different communities of practice. So, so the resources for answering questions that are, aren't part of the, the standard set, um, are, some of them are there if you look for them uh, and spend some time locating them. Creating a DIY ethos is, uh, I think, a larger question. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a, a strategic question for libraries in general, but uh, my personal view is it involves, it involves declaring what the organizational values are 
and then empowering people to experiment inside uh, um, in in developing services and pilots and uh, having some common uh, common framework for both transparency and and for how these experiments are evaluated. I'd also like to say as a, a reference librarian, so this is Lisa Horowitz about Margaret's question, is that um, I think the most, it depends on how you set up your organization and your makerspace. You know, do you decide that you have technical support because you need help with that kind of a response of a question? Or, you know, do you decide that you're going to refer people out? That's part of it anyway. But I think that thinking back to when we started to have all those printer questions that we didn't know how to deal with, or even now, you know, sometimes you get Microsoft Word questions or whatever. It's all part of figuring out how you're going to handle those in advance and not assuming that just because people are in your library and you have stuff to offer them that the people who are, serve the desk or serve as reference staff will actually troubleshoot. That's just my throwing in there. So this is Matt Bernhardt. Um, I would also chime in on the question of, of supporting a DIY, DIY ethos. Um, I think my perspective on that is that you can do a lot to reinforce that um, approach by making clear that these are not, uh, in terms of how you position the technologies, making clear that these are not turnkey services that someone simply drops a 3D model off at a reference desk and comes back later to pick up a, a finished model. If you position the technologies as this is something that we use together or that you expose or that you allow patrons to use kind of under supervision or in collaboration with library staff, that goes a great deal of the way towards um, establishing both for the librarians and for the patrons that this is a technology that we use together. This is not just a service that you set and forget and come back to later. Erica has sort of a clarifying follow-up question. So who's supposed to have this uh, DIY ethos, the librarian or the patron? Uh, I think the, the comments we were, we got were uh, directed at the librarian, that the librarian has to, to engage with the technology and the core competencies. Uh, but I think that it's also communicating, as Matt said, uh, the state of the technology to the patron. So patrons are often coming in with a do-it-yourself ethos. And, and librarians need to, to match that. Amanda asks, uh, how were some of the institutions that were a little further along addressing concerns with air quality and noise in the spaces? Did you see that in the responses? I, I don't recall seeing that in the responses, and it certainly wasn't a question that we asked in a quantitative way. In some of the uh, the surveys of makerspaces at MIT that we've done here and some of the reviews of the technology, um, it, it varies considerably. And the, the, um, the requirements for, a, for something like a water jet cutter uh, require sort of serious HVAC and safety monitoring, for example. Whereas uh, a 3D printer using PLA um, has very little environmental effect or, or safety effect, um, and the noise the, it may there may be some noise, but it's it's comparable to other office equipment can be dealt with in some traditional space planning way. So I, I think it's an important consideration for those who are at, at the um, farther experimental end of the section, but given that uh, most of the, the respondents are focusing on 3D printers and 3D scanners, the, the HVAC requirements are, are uh, well within sort of normal office setup. 
Oh, you, you might have answered uh, Randy Ryan's question here, but um, he asked, are safety training sessions required for patrons in some of these spaces? Is, is that a common uh, requirement? I, I'd have to, to go back to the qualitative responses to see how many, of uh, uh, what proportion. I, I don't have that offhand. Uh, it certainly is a requirement. Uh, every, it, in every service that we've looked at in detail, if there was a, uh, equipment that, that posed serious risk, there was a safety training requirement and generally some sort of monitoring requirement. Uh, but again, there's little safety risk from a 3D printer, um, though you could you, know, you could manage to uh, damage the equipment, uh, but not yourself, uh, or from a scanner, and and considerable from uh, from a cutter. Uh, Amy asks, has the makerspace become the primary campus space, or do units still build and support their own spaces within their silos? Uh, so uh, most most of the respondents reported a uh, a single or uh, if I recall correctly a single space, but that may uh, may not reflect all the spaces on campus. So I um, I'm not sure that we have the the evidence to to speak to that definitively. Um, when we you, you, MIT is unusual, but there, where we last counted, there were um, a dozen uh, maker and fabrication facilities, and there were also uh, several in the in the community. But I will say, this is Lisa again. I will say at the same time that although MIT has all those maker spaces, there are still people who based on a previous survey that we did of our own campus, they're still interested in it because their department doesn't offer it. So there's a mixed bag and there is a, I don't know what it's called, there is sort of a, um, an initiative to put a makerspace into a new dorm that may be coming up. So there are different ways of thinking about it. It sounded like your question is, is, is the library's makerspace the primary campus makerspace in my guess, I'm going to throw this out and Michael, you'll correct me if you saw somewhere that somebody says something different, but my sense is that it is only for those people who don't already have a place to go. Well, I, I think I would, I would amplify that. Um, we, we did a qualitative survey, uh, not, not public tier, of maker spaces at MIT, and what we found is that they generally weren't open to everyone. And so the, I think in many places the library is in a unique position of serving a broad community and an interdisciplinary one. And even, um, even those spaces that were available generally only addressed a particular part of the reference service. You know, how, where can I fabricate my model and how do I prepare? Um, the, there are a, a part of a, a maker service in libraries may involve answering these other questions too, introducing people to when a sort of physical information literacy, when information can solve their problem, where models are and how to find them in collections, both internally and externally, how to create new models. And the, the plethora of maker spaces in the area serve the last, generally serve the last parts of that question set. Uh, Ryan has a question on the average hours of access availability of these kinds of spaces. Uh, I, I don't have that, um, that offhand. Um, so I do think that we have, uh, in the detailed survey, we have uh, sample people reporting on, on hours of services. Most, I will, I do recall that most of them were not 24-7, but a subset of library hours. 
And uh, Jeffrey asked, um, did any of the libraries use students as part of their staffing models? And if they did, were they uh, paid or volunteers? I can go ahead and chime in on that because I have just looked up the answer to that question. This is Randy speaking. Uh, we did have 24 respondents who um, provided us with details about position titles, et cetera. And of those, eight did indicate that there were student workers. Um, it looks as if those would be paid. Um, they were called workers. Um, I did not see any indication of volunteer. In, in our, in our so other more local research, we did find examples of people who were in classes who would assist others. So, you know, a collaborative training model, part of the do-it-yourself ethic, but maybe not part of the, the formal service. Uh, James S., um, did you study the specific kinds of equipment used in the makerspaces? And by that he means, did more libraries buy high-end printers such as the Stratasys versus low-end models like the MakerBot? Um, I think that's that's the question. Is anybody staring at our, our survey results right now? To well, here I was looking up the hours question, but I haven't found <laughs> one yet. So. <laughs> um, All right. So sorry to go back to the hours question of the people who responded. Um, it looks like. About 25% are open all the hours the library is open, but others seem to restrict it to certain specific hours that relate to when they decide that they are appropriate. It does say for some of them, consultations are available outside of those times. Sometimes there's no service on the nights and weekends, other kinds of things. So it seems like probably, well, yes, 75% of them seem to restrict the hours to a certain subset of the library's open hours. And then the other question was about the equipment. Mm -hmm. So this is Matt Bernhardt. Um, I would, the impression that I have from the survey answers and also from the experience that of accompanying Micah on the interviews around the MIT campus is that from the library's perspective, uh, libraries are more often or more likely to skew towards the lower end of the technology scale, so offering things like printer bots or maker bots, um, as opposed to the super, you know, the higher end equipment like a Stratasys or the you know EO systems that can quickly run into six and seven figures, um, and that. And that applies not only with 3D printing, but um, for any kind of capability that you would take on, um, for any given manner of making, whether it's subtractive manufacturing or additive manufacturing, there are going to be kind of the 60% solutions versus the super capable or more, more highly specialized solutions. Um, and I think the libraries or any kind of campus level resource is going to more likely opt for the more general or 60% solutions. Just because when you start to try to solve the solutions of, that are offered by those $2 million or $200,000 machines, you quickly ramp up the, the, mon the monetary requirements and the staffing requirements. I would agree. I, I noticed that James has also reframed the question about did people use, were the, uh, did, his question was, did people use printers more for experimentation, pedagogy, low end, or for re actual research and production, high end? Uh, and I would reframe his reframing uh, and say that the intended use was to, I think, to support experimentation, pedagogy, and, and some degree of actual research. Um, and that uh, quite a bit of research can be done with uh, lower end equipment. For example, one of the exa one of the examples we encountered here was someone who was doing uh, biological modeling using a simple plastic tube as a model for the larynx, 
With a 3D printer, you can, even a low-end one, you can do much more complicated things. If you're doing robotics and need to make customized attachments, you can, uh, you know, a MakerBot will, will support real research. Uh, if you're visualizing a model of a satellite for discussion during uh, a working group. Again, the, uh, there, there are many research uses. I think production use was, uh, was not uh, a main target. Um, and I think actually this segues into the question from Erica England about what happens if we start thinking of the library as a Home Depot. Um, and I, I think my colleagues will want to chime in on this, but I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I think, the, the, I think the, the implication of that question is that fielding a maker space makes the library look a little bit like a Home Depot. And I think that is a risk, but that may be the, uh, I think that's the wrong way to think about the service. The service that a library usefully provides is not, uh, does not have, have a competitive advantage in the hardware. Um, for specialized hardware, or there are going to be particular departments, there are going to be particular service bureaus. If you want something printed in you know, wax and then made into platinum, you can do that online. Um, so we'll always be chasing the service bureaus there. But in connecting a patron with a particular uh, who has a problem to a particular set of answers, from going from the problem that may be a vague thought that some physical object can solve the problem to finding models, to curating models, to getting the information needed to modify them, and either printing a prototype in the library or finding an appropriate place to materialize that object, if it's as a service bureau or department or or a, a local fab shop. Uh, and I think that's a, a position which is sustainable in the library. We're just about out of time. We have a couple of quick questions here. Um, then we'll have to conclude. Um, Suzette asks, are there any specific power requirements or infrastructure needed for the kinds of services um, that are being offered now? So this, this is Matt Bernhardt. I'll take Suzette's question. Um, by and large, the kinds of equipment we're talking about do not have specialized power requirements. Um, the, the maker bots and uh, 3D printers specifically of that type uh, run off wall power, so there's no requirements for that. Um, should, should your library be in the fortunate position of spending $100,000 on a Stratasys system, they w there will be more restricted power requirements, but um, if you're in that conversation, the sales agent you're working with will communicate that to you. Um, similarly, for some of the, for the other kinds of equipment that are a little bit less prevalent, um, things like laser cutters, uh, or CNC machines, the, the big requirement there is less about power and more about air quality because you're starting to produce you know, off gases or you know, the dust or other, other contaminants that need to be treated environmentally. Um, so that's, but, but again, that's, that's a smaller segment of the responses in terms of what kinds of equipment are being offered. Thanks, Matt. And our last question from Margaret. Uh, for those who are charging fees, how is the fee structure determined? Right. Um, it looks like of 35 respondents, 31% are funding with some sort of usage fee. That's how they're funding it. I also have who is ch how many people are charging and why, but it doesn't say how they got to this point. A lot of people, it looks like, are trying to recover costs. So their goal is to charge by how much it weighs or um, have some sort of a base fee plus something to do with the weight. And that's just, talk most of those are talking about the 3D printing specifically. There is um, one library that responded that it has two tiers, and that, that actually relates to service. So they've decided to break down the pricing and whether somebody does it themselves or if they use the self-service model. So 
Yeah, a lot of them it looks like it's just trying to get some recovery of the money that they um, have put out towards the materials. I'd like to thank all of our um, authors and presenters and participants for your questions. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, you will receive um, links to the slides and recording within the next week. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That does conclude today's conference call. You may now disconnect. Presenters, consult the line.